The Chilimwa uprising was a rebellion against British colonial rule in Nyasaland in January 1915, led by John Chilimwa, an American-educated black millenarian Christian minister. The uprising was based around his church in the village of Mebomba in the southeast of the country. It was centered on the black middle class and encouraged by grievances against the colonial system, including forced labor, discrimination and the new demands on the indigenous population caused by the outbreak of World War I. The revolt broke out in the evening of 23 January 1915, when rebels, incited by Chilimwa, attacked the A. L. Bruce Plantation's headquarters at Magomero and killed three white colonists and a largely unsuccessful attack on a weapons store in Blantyre, followed during the night. By the morning of 24 January the colonial authorities had mobilized the white settler militia and redeployed regular military forces south. After a failed attack on Mabomba by troops of the King's African Rifles on 25 January, a group of rebels attacked a Christian mission at Galudi and burned it down. The car and militia took Mabomba without encountering resistance on 26 January after many of the rebels, including Chilimwa, fled, hoping to reach safety in neighboring Portuguese East Africa. About 40 rebels were executed in the revolt's aftermath, and 300 were imprisoned. Chilimwa was shot dead by a police patrol near the border on 3 February. Although the rebellion did not itself achieve lasting success, it is commonly cited as a watershed moment in Nyasaland history. The rebellion had lasting effects on the British system of administration in Nyasaland and some reform was enacted in its aftermath. After World War II, the growing Malawian nationalist movement reignited interest in the Chilimwa revolt, and after the independence of Malawi in 1964 it became celebrated as a key moment in the nation's history. Chilimbui's memory, which remains prominent in the collective national consciousness, has often been invoked in symbolism and rhetoric by Malawian politicians. Today, the uprising is celebrated annually and Chilimwa himself is considered a national hero. Background British colonial rule in the region of modern-day Malawi, where the revolt occurred, began between 1899 and 1900, when the British sought to increase their formal control over the territory to preempt encroachment by German or Portuguese colonial empires. The region became a British protectorate in 1891 and in 1907 was named Nyasaland. Unlike many other parts of Africa, where British rule was dependent on the support of local factions. In Nyasaland British control rested on military superiority. During the 1890s the colonial authorities put down numerous rebellions by the local Yao, Goni and CEWA peoples. British rule in Nyasaland radically altered the local indigenous power structures. The early colonial period saw some immigration and settlement by white colonists, who bought large swathes of territory from local chiefs often for token payments in beads or guns. Most of the land acquired, particularly in the Shire Highlands, was converted into plantations where tea, coffee, cotton and tobacco were grown. The enforcement of colonial institutions, such as the hut tax, compelled many indigenous people to find paid work and the demand for labor created by the plantations led to their becoming a major employer. Once employed on the plant Plantations, black workers found that they were frequently beaten and subject to racial discrimination. Increasingly, the plantations were also forced to rely on a system of forced labor a corvée, known locally as the Thangata, Chilimwa and the Providence Industrial Mission John Chilimwa, born locally in around 1871, received his early education at a Scottish mission and later met Joseph Booth, a radical Baptist missionary who ran the Zambezi Industrial Mission. Booth preached a form of egalitarianism and his progressive 
aggressive attitude towards race attracted Chilimbui's attention. Under Booth's patronage, Chilimbui traveled to the United States to study at a theological college in Virginia. There he mixed in African-American circles and was influenced by stories of the abolitionist John Brown and the egalitarianist Booker T. Washington. Chilimbui returned to Nyasaland in 1900 and founded his own independent church, the Providence Industrial Mission, in the village of Mabongwa. He was considered a model of non-violent African advancement by the colonial authorities during the mission's early years. He established a chain of independent black African schools, with over 900 pupils in total and founded the Natives Industrial Union, a form of cooperative union that has been described as an embryo chamber of commerce. Nevertheless, Chilimbui's activities led to friction with the managers of local plantations, who feared Chilimbui's influence over their workers. In November 1913, employees of the local Alexander Livingston Bruce Plantation burnt down Chilimbui's church in Mabomwa, though it was soon rebuilt. Chilimbui preached a form of millenarian Christianity, common in southern Africa at the time, which predicted the liberation of the Africans in the end of colonial rule. He preached aggressive sermons, often from the Old Testament, concentrating on two aspects such as the Israelites' escape from slavery in Egypt. Chilimbui's activities were initially supported by white missionaries. Information about his church before the rebellion is scant, but his ideology proved popular and he developed a strong local following. Chilimbui was not part of the apocalyptic Watchtower movement, which was popular in Central Africa at the time but some of his followers may have been influenced by it. Kitawala predicted that the apocalypse would occur in October 1914 and that God would then come to earth and end colonialism. Chilimbui's ideology grew more aggressive in the decade after his return to Nyasaland. He became demanding of his followers, encouraging them to adopt European-style intellectual improvement. The mission schools, meanwhile, began teaching racial equality, based on Christian teaching and anti-colonialism. Chilimbui adopted Western dress, customs and ideas and encouraged his followers to do likewise. Many of his followers came from the local middle class, who had similarly adopted European customs. Chilimbui's acceptance of European culture created an unorthodox anti-colonial ideology based around a form of nationalism, rather than a desire to restore the pre-colonial social order. Outbreak of World War I World War I broke out in July 1914. By September 1914, the war had spread to Africa as the British and Belgians began a long military campaign against the German colonial army in German East Africa. In Nyasaland, the major effect of the war was massive recruitment of Africans to serve as porters in support of the Allied armies. Porters lived in extremely poor conditions and many died. At the same time, the recruitment of porters created a shortage of labor which increased the economic pressure on Africans in Nyasaland. Chilimwa opposed the recruitment of black people to fight what he considered to be a war totally unconnected to them. He promoted a form of Christian pacifism and argued that the lack of civil rights for Africans in the colonial system should exempt them from the duty of military service. Millenarians at the time believed that World War I would be a form of Armageddon, which they believed would destroy the colonial powers and pave the way for the emergence of independent African states. In November 1914, following reports of large loss of life during fighting at Karonga, Chilimwa wrote a letter to the Nyasaland Times in Blantyre, explicitly appealing to the colonial authorities not to recruit black troops. As I hear that, war has broken out between you and other nations, only white men, I request, therefore, not to recruit more of my countrymen, my brothers who do not know the cause of your fight, who indeed, have nothing to do with it. 
It is better to recruit white planters, traders, missionaries and other white settlers in the country, who are, indeed, of much value and who also know the cause of this war and have something to do with it. Preparations Preparations for the uprising had begun by the end of 1914. Chilimba acquired a military manual and began to organize his followers and wider support. In particular, he formed close ties with Filippo Chinyama in NCHEU, 110 miles to the northwest and received his assurance that he would also mobilize his followers to join the rebellion when it broke out. The colonial authorities received two warnings that a revolt was imminent. A disaffected follower of Chile were reported the preacher's worrying intentions to Philip Mitchell, a minor colonial functionary who later served as governor of Uganda and Kenya, in August 1914. A Catholic mission was also informed. Neither took any action. Rebellion. Outbreak during the night of Saturday 23-24 January, the rebels met at the mission church in Mabomwa, where Chilimwa gave a speech stressing that none of them should expect to survive the reprisals that would follow the revolt but that the uprising would draw greater attention to their conditions and destabilize the colonial system. This, Chilimwa believed, was the only way change would ever occur. A contingent of rebels was sent to Blantyre and Limbe, about 15 miles to south, where most of the white colonialists lived and where the insurgents hoped to capture the African Lakes Company's store of weapons. Another group headed towards the Alexander Livingston Bruce Plantation's headquarters at Magomero. Chilimwa sent a messenger to NCHEU to alert Chinyama that the rebellion was starting. Chilimwa also sought support for his uprising from the German forces in German East Africa, on Nyasaland's far northern border, hoping that a German offensive from the north combined with a native insurrection in the south might force the British out of Nyasaland, permanently. On 24 January, he sent a letter to the German governor by courier through Portuguese East Africa. The courier was intercepted and the letter was never received. During the latter stages of the East African campaign, after the German invasion of Portuguese East Africa, the German colonial army actually helped to suppress anti-Portuguese rebellions among the Macomb and Bauru peoples, worrying that African uprisings would destabilize stabilize the colonial order. Attack on the Livingston Bruce Plantation The major action of the Chilimor uprising involved an attack on the Bruce Plantation at Magomero. The plantation spanned about 5,000 acres and grew both cotton and tobacco. Around 5,000 locals worked on it as part of their Thangata obligations. The plantation had a reputation locally for the poor treatment of its workers and for the brutality of its managers, who closed local schools, beat their workers and paid them less than had been promised. The burning of Chilimbui's church in November 1913 created a personal animosity with the rebel leadership. The insurgents launched two roughly concurrent attacks. One group targeted Magomero, the plantation headquarters and home of the main manager William Jervis Livingston and a few other white staff, while a second assaulted the plantation-owned village of Mwange, where there were two white households. The rebels moved into Magomero in the early evening, while Livingston and his wife were entertaining some dinner guests. The estate official, Duncan McCormick, was in another house nearby. A third building, occupied by Emily Stanton, Alice Roach and five children, contained a small cache of weapons and ammunition belonging to the local rifle club. The insurgents quietly broke into the Livingstone's house and injured him during hand-to-hand -hand fighting, prompting him to take refuge in the bedroom, where his wife attempted to treat his wounds. The rebels forced their way into the bedroom, and after capturing his wife, decapitated Livingston. 
McCormick, who had been alerted, was killed by a rebel spear. The attackers took the women and children of the village prisoner but shortly released them unhurt, having reportedly treated them well. It has been suggested that Chilimwe may have hoped to use the women and children as hostages, but this remains unclear. The attack on Magomero, and in particular the killing of Livingston, had great symbolic significance for Chilimbui's men. The two Mauser rifles captured from the plantation formed the basis of the rebel armory for the rest of the uprising. Mwanch had little military value but it has been proposed that the rebels may have hoped to find weapons and ammunition there. Led by Jonathan Chiguinia, the insurgents stormed one of the houses and killed the plantation's stock manager, Robert Ferguson, with a spear as he lay in bed reading a newspaper. Two of the colonists, John Robertson and his wife Charlotte, escaped into the cotton fields and walked six miles to a neighboring plantation to raise the alarm. One of the Robertson's African servants, who remained loyal, was killed by the attackers. Later actions, the rebels cut the Zombatet and Blantyre McCallong with telephone lines, delaying the spread of the news. The African Lakes Company weapons store in Blantyre was raided by a force of around 100 rebels at around 2 o'clock on 24 January, before the general alarm had been raised by news of the Magomero and Mwanj attacks. The defenders mobilized after an African watchman was shot dead by the rebels. The insurgents were repulsed, but not before they had captured five rifles and some ammunition, which was taken back to Mabongwa. A number of rebels were taken prisoner during the retreat from Magomero. After the initial attacks on the Bruce plantation, the rebels returned home. Livingstone's head was taken back and displayed at the Providence Industrial Mission on the second day of the uprising as Chilimwe preached a sermon. During much of the rebellion, Chilimwe remained in Mabomwa praying and leadership of the rebels was taken by David Kaduya, a former soldier in the King's African Rifles. Under Kaduya's command, the rebels ambushed a small party of government soldiers near Mabomwa on 24 January, described as the one reverse suffered by the government during the uprising. By the morning of 24 January the government had levied the Nyasaland Volunteer Reserve, a settler militia, and redeployed the 1st Battalion, car from the north of the colony. The rebels did not mount any further attack any of the many other isolated plantations in the region. They also did not occupy the Boma at Kairadzulu just five miles from Mabongwa, even though it was ungarrisoned at the time. Rumors of rebel attacks spread, but despite earlier offers of support, there were no parallel uprisings elsewhere in Nyasaland and the promised reinforcements from NCHEU did not materialize. The Malanja Zomba regions likewise refused to join the uprising. Siege of Mabomwa and attempted escape troops of the car launched a tentative attack on Mabomwa on 25 January but the engagement proved inconclusive. Chilimbui's forces held a strong defensive position along the Mabomwa River and could not be pushed back. Two African government soldiers were killed and three were wounded. Chilimbui's losses have been estimated as about 20. On 26 January, a group of rebels attacked a Catholic mission at Galudi belonging to Father Swelson. The mission was defended by four African armed guards, one of whom was killed. Swelson was also wounded in the fighting and the church was burnt down. The military and militia forces assaulted Mebomwa again the same day but encountered no resistance. Many rebels, including Chilimwa, had fled the village disguised as civilians. Mebomwa's fall and the government troops' subsequent demolition of Chilimbui's church with dynamite ended the rebellion. Kiduya was captured and brought back to Magomero where he was publicly executed. After the defeat of the rebellion, most of the remaining insurgents attempted to escape eastwards across the Shire Highlands, towards Portuguese East Africa. 
Africa, from where they hoped to head north to German territory. Chilimwa was seen by a patrol of Nyasaland police and shot dead on 3 February near Melange. Many other rebels were captured, 300 were imprisoned following the rebellion and 40 were executed. Around 30 evaded capture and settled in Portuguese territory near the Nyasaland border. After Ma, worrying that the rebellion might rapidly reignite and spread, the colonial authorities instigated arbitrary reprisals against the Nyasa population, including mass hut burnings. All weapons were confiscated and fines of four shillings per person were levied in the districts affected by the revolt. Regardless of whether the people in question had been involved, the colonial government also began attacking the rights of missionaries in Nyasaland and banned many independent churches, including Kitawala, from Nyasaland, and placed restrictions on other African-run churches. Public gatherings, especially those associated with African-initiated religious groups, were banned until 1919. Fear of similar uprisings in other colonies, notably northern Rhodesia, also led to similar repression of independent churches and foreign missions beyond Nyasaland. Though the rebellion failed, the threat to colonial rule posed by the Chilimwa revolt compelled the local authorities to introduce some reform. The colonial government proposed to undermine the power of independent churches like Chilimbwis by promoting secular education education but lack of funding made this impossible. The government began to promote tribal loyalties in the colony, through the system of indirect rule, which was expanded after the revolt. In particular, the Muslim Liao people, who attempted to distance themselves from Chilimwa, were given more power and autonomy. Although delayed by the war, the Nyasaland police, which had been primarily composed of African Askaris levied by local white officials, was restructured as a professional force of white colonists. Forced labor was retained and would remain a resentment for decades afterwards. Commission of Inquiry In the aftermath of the revolt, the colonial administration formed a commission of inquiry to examine the causes and handling of the rebellion. The commission, which presented its conclusions in early 1916, found that the revolt was chiefly caused by mismanagement of the Bruce Plantation. The commission also blamed Livingston himself for treatment of natives often unduly harsh, and for poor management of the estate. The commission found that the systematic discrimination, lack of freedoms and respect were key causes of resentment among the local population. It also emphasized the effect of Booth's ideology on Chilimwa. The commission's reforms were not far-reaching, though it criticized the Thang Arta system. It made only minor changes aimed at ending casual brutality, though the government passed laws banning plantation owners from using the services of their tenants as payment of rent in 1917. Effectively abolishing Thang Arta, it was uniformly ignored. A further commission in 1920 concluded that the Thang Arta could not be effectively abolished, and it remained a constant source of friction into the 1950s. 